What is up you guys, Dr. Gooden here, and I'm so excited to be talking about the knee joint with you today. So in these next three videos, we'll talk about first the bony landmarks, then the joint movements of the knee, which are relatively simple as a hinge joint after all, although there's a little bit of hidden complexity there. And then we'll talk about the muscles that cross the knee and perform actions on the knee. Okay, so let's learn about our bodies. All right, now these slides come from the Manual of Structural Kinesiology by R.T. Floyd, chapter nine. Presented by me, Dr. Jacob Gooden. Okay, so the knee joint is the largest joint in the body, believe it or not, and it is very complex, so don't let the fact that it's a hinge joint fool you. It does have some complexities. Now, it's primarily a hinge joint, but there are some other movements that go on other, uh, at the knee other than purely hinging. Now, as far as the bones go, we have the femoral and tibial condyles articulating on each other. And you can see them down here. Here's the lateral condyle of the femur, the medial condyle of the femur. And they're not labeled, but the tibial condyles are here and here as well. So here are those articulating surfaces. And we'll see this in later slides, but the medial and lateral tibial condyles act as receptacles for the femoral condyles. Now the tibia, this larger bone in the center here, it bears most of the weight, and the fibula is mostly an attachment for lower leg musculature. So here's the fibula, the head of which is very prominent. Out here on the side, you can palpate that on yourself. As I said, this serves as an attachment point for knee joint structures, and it doesn't actually articulate with the femur or the patella. You can see that it's articulating here with the tibia, and here with the tibia, but not with the femur at all. So it's technically not part of the knee joint. And then we have the patella, which is right here. The sesamoid or floating bone arises in the middle of the patellar tendon, and it serves to increase the mechanical advantage of the pulley mechanism of your quadriceps muscles. And this results in a greater mechanical advantage during the extension. It does this by increasing the moment arm of the patellar tendon. So if you think about it, if you remember back to biomechanics and levers, or maybe even at the start of your structural kinesiology course, if we talked about levers, when you're calculating mechanical advantage for a lever, um, we want to look at the ratio of the moment arm of the muscle force versus the moment arm of the resistive force. And just by having the patella in the patellar tendon, it increases the mechanical advantage of the quadriceps ever so slightly. Now some important bony landmarks of the knees would include the tibial tuberosity, right here where the patellar tendon inserts, Gertie's tubercle over here, which is just superior and lateral to that, the medial and lateral femoral condyles, which I highlighted earlier, here and here. The upper anterior medial tibial surface. So that's going to be opposite of Gertie's tubercle over here in this area. And then the head of the fibula. And you should be able to palpate these on your own knee and on somebody else's knee as well. Now the three vasti muscles, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis and vastus intermedius, they all originate on the proximal femur and insert on the patellar superior pole. So that's going to be the top of the patellar tendon. Ultimately though, because of the patellar tendon, they all insert via the tibial tuberosity. The IT band of the TFL muscle inserts on Gertie's tubercle. And then we have sartorius and gracilis, as well as semitendinosus inserting just below the medial condyle on the upper anteromedial surface of the tibia. So we talked about some of these muscles when we talked about the hip in the last few videos, and it's important to remember that a lot of them are biarticulate, so they cross the hip and the knee, they have actions at both of those joints. So it might be a little bit of review. Membranosis is going to insert posterior medially on the medial tibial condyle, so very similar to where semitendinosus inserts. Biceps femoris now is going to be on the other side, on that lateral side, inserting primarily on the fibula head. And then popliteus, which is a small muscle right behind the knee, this originates on the lateral aspect 
of the femoral condyle. And then we have the medial and lateral collateral ligaments, or also called the tibial and fibular collateral ligaments. And the medial collateral ligament originates on the medial aspect, hence its name, of the upper medial femoral condyle and inserts on the medial tibial surface. So this, so this structure is on the medial aspect of the knee, providing support, keeping you out of knee valgus. And the lateral collateral ligament is now going to be on the lateral aspect of the knee, originating on the lateral femoral condyle, close to the popliteus origin, inserting on the fibular head. So one of these, one of these ligaments is on each side of the knee, providing medial and lateral stability. So as a joint, the knee is classified as a hinge joint or a ginglemus joint. I honestly don't know how to say that word. Ginglemus, gingelemus. If you know how, let me know in the comments if I can pronounce that better. But it's a hinge joint. I just call it a hinge joint. Sometimes it's actually referred to as a pivotal hinge because not only do we have that hinging flexion and extension, but there's also inflection, a little bit of external and internal rotation at the knee. And we're going to see that in the next video. Now the patellofemoral joint is classified as an arthrodial or plane joint because of the gliding nature of the patella. If you straighten your own knee, if you fully extend it and it's um, relaxed, you relax your quadricep muscles, some of you might have a little bit of play in your patella and you can actually slide and glide it around. Um, don't do it too hard, you don't want to pop it out of place. But it just glides around on, that, on those femoral condyles. Now, as far as stability of the knee, I'm sure you have heard of ACL injuries, meniscus injuries, and so you might be thinking, oh, well, the knee is relatively unstable. It's actually supposed to be highly stable. It's just that oftentimes the knee is subject to a lot of extraneous forces and tries to sort of clean up the mess of our poor movement patterns <clears throat> or of high velocity movements or erratic movements, say, say you get tackled from the side and then its structural integrity can fail. So it does have a lot of ligamentous support as well as muscular support. <clears throat> so our ligaments provide static stability, whereas our musculature provides dynamic stability. Okay, and that's important because we, we can't necessarily improve the static stability of our ligaments, but we can train the muscles to provide more dynamic stability. We also have the articular cartilage surfaces on the femur and tibia that help to promote the gliding and smooth movement of the knee. And then we have the menisci, which form cushions between the bones. And you can see here, both of these menisci are shaped like C's. You have the medial meniscus being the bigger of the two C's, and then the lateral meniscus looking like a small backward C. Now in this cross section, you can also see the ACL ligament, which is cut here, and the PCL ligament, which is cut there. The ACL runs from anterior up to posterior, and the PCL runs from posterior up to anterior, and we're going to talk about those in a second. Out here is the lateral collateral ligament, which is shown cut, and then we have the medial collateral ligament here, okay, providing medial and lateral support. Now each of the menisci, as I said, they form receptacles for the femoral condyles. We have a thicker border on the outside and they taper down to a thin border on the inside. And they also can slip about slightly but are held in place by very small ligaments. As I mentioned, the medial meniscus is larger whereas the lateral meniscus is smaller, more of a closed C configuration. Now, because of the tapering of the menisci, they taper from thick down to thin. And so those femoral condyles kind of slip right into place and they can move around a little bit, but that tapering allows them to kind of stay in these uh, shallow depressions. Either of the menisci can be torn for several reasons, whether it's chronic or acute, Maybe it's you know, long-term jogging or running or pounding motions, or maybe it's a very quick twisting motion of the knee. Tears often occur due to significant compression in shear forces during rotation while flexing or extending. So if you're, say, changing direction as your knee is flexed, putting a lot of force on it and rotating during, during flexion or extension, 
particularly during high speed, that's when a meniscus could start to tear. Now we also have the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, or the ACL and PCL. These cross within the knee to join the tibia and the femur. They hold them in place on each other. They are vital in maintaining anterior and posterior stability as well as rotary stability. So one of the most common injuries that we see are ACL or anterior cruciate lig ligament injuries. Now oftentimes people imagine knee injuries as being from contact, but really ACL injuries happen through non-contact mechanisms. Um, it usually involves some sort of rotary component at the knee where perhaps you're cutting quickly or maybe you're tw a twisting motion as your foot is planted and that twists the knee because the ACL and PCL uh, have a rotary stability component to them. And so if you twist that knee very quickly, especially as it's loaded, we can have that ACL pop or even just a violent contraction of the quadriceps. So I have a buddy back in Tennessee who would go to all the East Tennessee State basketball games. And during one particular halftime show, they were having some sort of a layup contest where people from the stands could come out and if they make a layup, they win a shirt or something like that. So, you know, this average Joe comes down from the crowd because they called his name and he's all pumped and his buddies are cheering for him and he gets the basketball and he's going to go make this layup, win himself a t-shirt. And on his first step, his first step to go into a run, because perhaps he was detrained, he was out of shape, it was post-college, so he'd let himself go a little bit, wasn't necessarily an overweight guy, but um, just hadn't been using his musculature and his perhaps his hamstrings were super weak. I don't know, but he took that first step and that was enough of a quadriceps contraction to just snap his ACL and he went down with an ACL tear. It's unfortunate, but it happens. Now the posterior cruciate ligament, or the PCL, is not as often injured unless there's some sort of direct contact from an opponent. And you can see the PCL here running from the posterior through the knee up into the anterior part as it moves superiorly. The fibular collateral ligament or lateral collateral ligament is also infrequently injured. You can see that here on the side, going from the head of the fibula up to the lateral femoral condyle. And then the MCL or the tibial collateral ligament, this is also commonly injured along with the ACL. It maintains that medial stability, as I said before, by resisting valgus forces. Now, if you're a kinesiology major, then you probably have heard or you know that in females, the knees tend to be in a more valgus position due to the larger Q angle from having wider pelvic bones than males. And so therefore, there's a lot more valgus stress on the structures of the knee, potentially leading to greater incidences of ACL tears and MCL tears and meniscus problems. Now, that's probably not the only contributing factor, probably strength is a contributing factor as well, as well as expectations of girls as they're going through the motor development stage, where you have a higher societal expectation for boys to run around and play sports than you do for girls, unfortunately. We're, as a society, catching up, where we're, we're actually now, I think, better than ever, but not perfect yet, allowing for more and more opportunities and encouragement for girls to be active and to do strength training and to run and jump the same as boys, but there's still that catch up that's involved. And so right now the research is kind of back and forth on whether it's an inherently female thing or whether through training females can get to a better and lower incidence of these knee injuries as compared to males. And so that wraps up the bony landmarks of the knee. Remember the knee is a hinge joint, but it has some interesting movement components. There's an internal and external rotary component and we're going to look in the next couple of videos at how the joint moves as well as how the muscles across the knee aid in that joint movement. Okay, so if you want to check out that next video, it's going to be right over here to my right. Just go ahead and click on that. If you're interested in any other videos having to do with structural kinesiology, go ahead and click on the list over here to keep watching. I'm Dr. Gooden. Thanks for learning about the human body with me and I'll see you in the next video.